Hi, welcome to Checking In with Amy. My name is Amy Goldberg. I'm a registered nurse with the Elder Service Plan of the East Boston Neighborhood Health Center. We take care of people who are 55 years of age and older who live in our catchment area, which includes East Boston, Chelsea, Revere, Winthrop, Everett, and our new catchment area of Malden, Medford, Melrose, Stoneham, and Boston's North End. Today, my guest for part two is Dr. Diana Iandolo, who's an optometrist at the East Boston Neighborhood Health Center. So welcome back, Thank Diana. Thank you, thank you. So we had so much to say the first time that I thought we need to have a part two. Okay. So here we are. All right. Um, so my first question would be, let's talk about what happens when someone has an eye exam. What do you do and what are you looking for? So there's a couple parts to a routine eye exam. One is to check your vision to see what type of glasses you need. The other part is to examine the eye health to make sure there's no signs of any eye disease. So we look at the front of the eye, but we also like to look inside the eye. The way we do that is by dilating your pupil. So if we look at the picture here, on the left is a picture of an undilated pupil and it's small in its natural state. When we look at the picture on the right, that is a dilated pupil, so you can see the black part in the center is much larger. This is our window to look inside the eye, so if it's undilated, it's like looking into a room through a keyhole. You see a very small amount. When we dilate, it's like opening the door so that we can check all the corners of the room to make sure everything's healthy. This is important because we're checking one, the eye structures to make sure the eye itself is healthy. But it's also the only place in the body where we can see the blood vessels without being invasive, having to cut you open. So how the blood vessels look in your eyes, how they also can look in other parts of your body, such as your kidney. So sometimes we're the first people to see signs of things like high blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol. So we'll say, hey, you know, when's the last time you saw your primary care doctor? It might be time to go back. Right. A lot of people don't like to have their eyes dilated because there is side effects. So it's generally two eye drops that we put in the eye. It takes about 10, 15 minutes to work. Then we do our exam. When you leave, you're going to be sensitive to light because your pupil is large. All the light is able to enter. You're not able to control it. So things seem very bright. So when you leave, we'll most likely give you a pair of uh, temporary sunglasses if you don't bring your own to help with that extra light sensitivity. The other part is it does leave your vision blurry. So if you've never had your eyes dilated before, you wanna plan on not driving yourself home. Bring somebody with you to drive or plan on taking the public transportation or, or walking. Some people do drive after they're dilated, but if it's your first time, you wanna make sure that you bring right. somebody with you because it is very important to do this part of a routine eye exam. So the next question would be, how often should we have eye exams? Yeah, that's a good question too. So for routine eye exams, 18 to 60, the general rule is every two years. Okay. Once we get to 61 and older, you want to have an eye exam every year because the risk of developing eye disease increases as we get older. Right. Now, if you have um, eye conditions, eye disease, or eye disease in your family, you should probably be seen more frequently, but your eye care provider would tell you uh, how quickly you should have to come back. Okay. But every two years up until 60 and then every year after that. One problem that I know is very common is called dry eye. And as we spoke, you and I, <laughs> I have like a million of these things going on. So dry eye. So let's talk about what causes that. Dry eye is so common because it has a whole bunch of causes. So one is age. As we get older, mm. our tear glands just don't work as well as they used to, so the eye becomes more dry. Another causes or females are more likely to have dryness than males just because our hormones are different so we're more prone to dryness. Another cause uh, is medications both prescribed and ones that you can buy over the counter. So anti-allergy uh, decongestants mm, right. can cause dryness and certain medications like high blood pressure medication which is common for people to take can also cause your eyes to be more dry. Environmental conditions such as the weather, 
So in the winter, it's very dry out. And when we come inside the house, the heat's on. So the house is usually pretty dry too. So that can make things worse. Generally, dryness is worse in the winter. Certain systemic conditions can also make you more prone to dryness. Diabetes, certain types of arthritis, thyroid conditions, and contact lens wearers, contacts dry your eyes out. So people who wear contacts are more dry than people who don't wear contacts. So a whole list of, of reasons why you can have it. Okay. <laughs> That's not so good. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> so in what, so dry eye, if you were to explain to the viewers, what does it feel like? The symptoms for dryness also has a wide range. Most commonly, burning or scratchy feeling, so like you have a piece of sand dirt in your eye, is very common for dryness. One that's also very common that people kind of get confused with is that it can cause watering or tearing. So I'll tell people, oh, you have dryness, and they'll say, no, no, my eyes are too wet, and they're not dry, I have too many tears. When your eyes are dry, the response of the body is to make more tears, but it kind of makes too many. It's like a reflex mode, and it right. makes the type of tears when we cry. So then our eye feels wet and it starts to spill over. But really, we need to treat the dryness so that our body doesn't go into that, that reflex mode. Blurry vision is also another one that people sometimes come in thinking that they need a new pair of glasses. And I'll say, nope, you have dryness. So when the eyes dry, our, our, our tear film has a poor quality. So it's kind of like looking through like a dirty windshield. And sometimes you try to blink, like cleaning the, wind, the, the wipers on your car to get a good, uh, better view. So sometimes it's not your glasses, it's just the dryness. And then last one, anytime our eyes are unhappy for any reason, they're going to tell us by saying, I'm red. So anytime your eyes are red, it could be for a whole host of reasons, but one of those re reasons can be dry eye. Okay, and what would we do to treat it? So now we know what it is and what it feels like, and is there a treatment? There are multiple treatments. There's three layers of your tears, and each layer can have a different problem with it, and there's different treatments for each layer. So I would recommend going to your eye care provider to get specialized treatment for you. But there are some things that you can do at home that are safe for the eyes to try to treat your dryness. One is to put more moisture back into the eyes, and you can do this by using a over-the-counter eye drop. So this eye drop is called an artificial tear, on the box, it'll usually say for dry eye or it'll say lubrication. It's not a medicine, so it's very safe for you to use. Anytime your eye feels uncomfortable for any reason, you can always put a drop in. There are eye drops that you can buy over the counter that are not as healthy for the eyes, such as Visine or Clear Eyes. Those are the ones that say they get the red out. Those ones you should not be using. Okay. So if you have any questions, you can always ask your eye care provider, but lubricating eye drops are safe. Another treatment for dryness is to put heat on your eyes. So there are tear glands in our, in our bottom lid and our top lid. And one common form of dryness is those tear glands, they become clogged. They're not flowing as freely as they should. And simply putting a warm towel over your closed eyes will help to open up those glands so that they can start to flow more freely. That's something that's good for everybody. Just get a clean washcloth, run it under hot water, you rinse it out and you hold it over your closed eyes for 10 minutes before you go to bed, say. Another treatment that we recommend for patients, which seems simple, is just to remind yourself to blink. So <laughs> blinking helps to make tears. And when we don't blink, the eye dries out. So when we're doing mm. things that we're concentrating on, primarily computer, TV, looking at our phones, driving, our blink rate decreases. We don't blink as often as we should because we're staring at our screen concentrating. So just to remind yourself to, to blink at a normal rate can sometimes just help your dryness just with that alone. So one thing that you taught me, this is my big aha moment from our sessions, mm -hmm. was when we talked about putting in eye drops. So I'm a nurse, I know how to put in an eye drop, but you taught me one easy way to do it. Mm -hmm. So I think everybody in the world would want to know this. Okay, <laughs> a lot of people are apprehensive about putting drops in because you have to look at the eye dropper as it's coming towards your eye and your instinct is to blink and that's natural. So one simple way that you can put an eye drop in is you close your eyes and you put your head back. You can lay down if you want on a couch or a bed, but the head just has to be back. 
then you take your eye drop and you put a couple of drops right in the corner here and you'd be doing this with your head backwards and then you just simply open up your eyes and the drop will roll in so the entire time you can keep your eyes closed head back a couple of drops and then just open and the drop will go in Nice so I did it. Yeah. And it works. Okay, I was good. Like so excited. Good. Yeah, it does. We do it a lot for kids right. that have a hard time letting us put the drops in. It's very simple and it's it's still it's, it's very not effective. It's scary because you, it, the dropper isn't. You're not looking at it. You're not so, looking at but it. But very effective. Okay. So I hope somebody gets something out of that. Um, so something else that I wanted to discuss was a sty. So what is it? Let's talk about that. Okay, so a sty is a complication of the type of dryness we talked about where your, your tear glands can get a little congested. With a sty, the, the whole gland gets blocked and you can actually get a little infection inside that blockage because things aren't moving. So this is really simple to treat, but there's sort of no magic bullet that we can say, here's a eye drop, it's gonna go away in a day. Right. And when people come in, they can be really sore, really painful to the touch, swollen, red. So it's very symptomatic for them and they want it to go away quickly. But doing the heat that we talked about is basically the only treatment for this. So you need to heat up that gland so that it can start to express itself and start to move. So you do the heat frequently and for long periods of time. So we usually say you want to try to do it 15 minutes at a time, four times a day. The more you do the heat, the quicker this will go away. Because it's inside your eyelid, topical eye drops won't penetrate deep enough. So even though there is an infection there, we don't need to treat it because we can't get any medicine there. Mm -hmm. And just doing the heat will take care of it itself. This is where you might have heard the, the old wives tale of putting a tea bag on right. your eye. Yeah. So it's not the tea itself that helps, it's the heat. Mm -hmm. Helps to sort of just get it to express itself. Rarely, uh, the, it sometimes cannot um, loosen up and it may not be tender anymore, but you still have a little bump. So sometimes that happens after say three or four weeks of doing the heat. In that case, you wanna see your eye care provider will tell you what to do about it. But most of the time, put the heat on as frequently as you can and you'll start to see that it slowly gets better. But it can take several days to weeks for it to go away. So again, I had that the other day. Yes, and it's not contagious too. Yeah. So you're okay to go about your business I just know. with that bump on your eye. I <laughs> mean, I was like, I'm very timely for this. Um, the next thing um, are called floaters. So what is a floater? When do you call the doctor? What's mm -hmm. all that about? Floaters are, are common, so a lot of people have questions about it. Inside the eye is a fluid. And when we're born, it's more of a consistency of jello. And as we get older, it starts to turn into liquid. This fluid is stuck up against the wall of the eye. So as this process is happening, this normal aging process, we can develop floaters. Some floaters are normal, not a problem. Other floaters can be a warning sign that there's a bigger problem going on inside the eye. So when we have this change from this jello to this liquid, this fluid starts to pull away from the wall of the eye. And as it starts to tug on the wall of the eye, the eye won't say ouch or pain, the eye's gonna say light. So as you have this tugging, you can get flashes of light and they quick like a lightning bolt. When it pulls away, you sometimes have this little piece of jelly floating around in your eye. And if you look at the picture on the left, it's a representation of what you might see. Sometimes they're clear like that, translucent, and sometimes they can be dark black. Some people say dots or strings or spider webs. So if that's a piece of the jelly that came off and the wall is perfectly intact, not a problem. Sometimes it can take a piece of the wall with it and now you have a hole in the wall of your eye called your retina. That's when we run into problems. If you have a hole, you have a point where now this fluid can get underneath and you can have a retinal detachment, which is similar to like wallpaper peeling off of the wall. When the wallpaper comes off the wall, you need to do surgery to put that same wallpaper back on, but it's never gonna be the same as it was when it was first up. This can cause permanent vision loss. So if you have flashes of light, or you see floaters, you want to call an eye care provider as soon as possible in order to prevent a retinal detachment. If you do have a little hole in the wall, 
we can do a simple laser procedure, seal it up, everything's fixed, no problem. When we run into an issue is when we um, delay calling and then now we have that hole and then everything starts to go downhill from there. So if you have any flashes of light or floaters or even just simply something weird that you're not sure what it is, right. pick up the phone and call and then we'll tell you how quickly to come in. And it's not because you have a problem. Most times everything's fine, right. but we're preventing a bigger problem which could possibly be a retinal detachment. That's so. huge. Mm -hmm. People need to pay attention to this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any question, pick up the just phone and call. call. Just There's call right away. Just a long phone call. Exactly, You're just exactly. Yep. Being cautious. Exactly. And proactive. We'd much rather you bother us and call than right. to come in three weeks later and right. say, oh, yeah, I had that floater a long time ago. And the next topic, which is probably a lot could be difficult for people is when they get a diagnosis of being legally blind. Mm. What does legally blind mean? Mm. So there's two qualifications for being legally blind. One is that your vision in your better eye is 2200. What that means is somebody with normal vision can see 200 feet away what somebody who's legally blind has to be only 20 feet away to see. So 200 to 20 feet, it's a significant decrease in right. your vision. The other definition is to have a small visual field. So your visual field is the total amount that you can see when you're keeping your eyes straight without moving them. And a normal visual field can be 180, even more degrees than that. Right. Legally blind is 20 degrees or less. So you have very small tunnel vision with that. When a patient comes in for an eye exam and they meet either one of these criteria, the eye care provider is mandated to register you with the Mass Commission for the Blind. This is not something that we can discuss with the patient and ask them if they want this. We have to register them with the Mass Commission for the Blind. I think that this is a good thing because there is resources available for them once they are registered with the Mass Commission. A lot of people are scared by that title because they think that it means that they're going to be blind where they're, they're not going to see in either eye totally right. black. That's not the case. You still have, can have vision even though you're, you're legally blind. So one thing you said was about driving. Mm -hmm. So what happens if you see a patient and they meet the criteria as being legally blind, then what? So we register them with the commission, the Mass Commission for the Blind. The next step that they do is they do contact the DMV to have your license revoked. A lot of people are afraid to give up their license because it means giving up their independence. Right. But the legal limits to drive for your vision in legally blind, there's a big space in between there where you have not been driving for a long period of time anyways. Right. So it's more of like a security blanket for these people that they don't want to give up their license. But your license will be revoked. On the other end of that, there are benefits that the commission will provide for you. So they right. will contact you. You don't have to contact them. And then they'll talk to you about the resources and programs available to you now that you're in this uh, criteria. So there are a lot of benefits with, with the, the Mass Commission for the Blind. They'll provide you with certain telephone equipment that have nice large buttons on there so that you can still make your phone calls. Right. There's lots of tax exemptions and deductions to make things financially easier for you, say if you're not able to work anymore. If you have a car and somebody else drives your car for you to take you around, you are eligible for um, disabled plates and you're able to get a um, blind access trolley car, which is free transportation on, on the T. Mm. And there are benefits through the ride also. So they know that you're not able to take yourself around, but they're trying to still allow you to stay independent by giving you these resources to help you with that. So, and there's other benefits too that, that they can talk about helping you at home, helping you at work, to do adaptive things to allow you to still stay independent. So. I think that when you get to that point, being registered is a positive thing for, for the patient. It doesn't right. have to be negative. So in both, um, both of our meetings, we talked about people losing their sight, mm. which is beyond scary, to me anyways. I would hate it. So there are aids out there for people, 
and I thought maybe if we could show a few of them, that would help people. There's a whole specialty called low vision that a lot of people don't know about. This specialty of eye care providers maximize the vision you have left to allow you to do what you need to do. So in this type of exam, the doctor would say, what are you having difficulty with because your vision is not as good as it used to be? Right. So it could be reading your mail, signing your checks, watching TV. They're going to do their exam to find other devices to allow you to do the things you want to do with right. the vision that you have left. So I brought some of the examples here. So one thing is, is a magnifier, and the magnifiers that low vision would provide you are not the same ones you buy in the store. So one, these always come with an excellent LED light to help you to see better. Generally, the brighter things are, the better it is for you to see. These also have different levels of magnification. So they would tell you and prescribe to you the type of magnification that you need to do whatever task that you want to do. They have portable versions that you can put in a pocketbook or wow. your pocket or so to take with you for menus and price tags, things like that. There's also things for far away telescopes and such. This is a pair of glasses that are meant for using with the TV. So if you like to watch sports and you can't see the little ticker tape on the bottom, for example, these glasses have different settings that again would be prescribed to you for whatever your visual need is. Nowadays with technology, the advancements in these devices is significantly better. So we now have digital monitors that you can take with you that uh, will magnify things for you. Mm. So we do have one picture of a closed circuit television that if we look at the woman on the right, she has her monitor and then there's a camera on that monitor and she has it angled towards her face that she can put her makeup on. The other thing that you can do is you can angle the camera downward so that you're now looking at some type of material, your, your meal, or you can put your check under there so that when you're signing everything's magnified, you can make sure that you're on, on the line. They have these types of devices that are portable and they look similar to a cell phone and it has the camera on it, and it has the magnification, so you can go to the store, put the price tag underneath it, and then be wow. able to see, or your menu, or what have you. So there are a lot of devices available that can keep you independent and in doing the things that you wanna do. There's not a lot of low vision providers around, so I would say if you think that you would benefit from this, talk to your eye care provider, and they can recommend you to, to one of these specialists. But just because you have lost vision doesn't mean that it's the end of the road for you. There's, there's still um, other opportunities out there. Thank you so much. So much information. Mm -hmm. I never knew about the eye drop. Mm -hmm. I never knew about low vision specialists. Yep. Mm -hmm. So those are two things that are real huge takeaways. And Absolutely. About the floaters and the bursts of light, people need to pay attention. Absolutely. So... Diana, thank you so much you for are being welcome. my guest. Thank you. We really um, appreciate this. So until we meet again, um, I want to thank you for tuning in to Checking In with Amy. Um, our mission with the Elder Service Plan is to keep people living independently, healthy, and active for their lifestyles. If you have any questions or you would like to find out more about our program, please feel free to call us at 617-568-6377 and we will be glad to answer your questions. And if you would like information, we can also send that out to you in a checking in with Amy bag. So until we meet again, please be well. Thank you. My parents were always very independent. They always seemed to take care of each other. My dad met my mom when she was 13 and he was 15, so they got a lot of practice. 
It was really difficult when they were faced with health challenges and started to need some help. It, it was also really hard on me and my brothers. It seemed like uh, every day we were getting calls, they needed to go to this appointment or that appointment, and it became pretty apparent that they you know, really couldn't live on their own without some help, and more importantly, stay healthy. We're lucky to find the Elder Service Plan. Uh, almost immediately after enrolling, uh, we saw some real change for the positive. Uh, all their medical appointments were in the same location, including the prescriptions. Uh, if they did need to go to a, see a specialist, then transportation would take them, and that was a big relief for us. Uh, my mom attended the Pace Day Center each day where she could really socialize, and she loved that. Uh, when they needed services in the home, that was a big help too. Uh, and my dad, you know, he'd still call me every day, but uh, not because he had to, because he wanted to. He'd say, Stevie, you know, you won't believe it, they fixed my teeth, uh, they got me some new shoes today. Uh, it just brought some amazing stability to the family. I'll see you a little later today, okay? Okay. My name is Lucas Akerley. I'm the activities coordinator for the Elder Service Plan in Winthrop. Today we're doing active parachute games. We uh, have a ball toss with some music. It's fun. Keeping active at ESP is part of our plan to keep you happy, healthy, and independent. Our mission at the Elder Service Plan is to keep our participants living safely in the community. And we do that in a number of ways, the first being with the physician and the entire team to take care of the person medically. We also try to think creatively and provide other things that they may need, be it shopping service, laundry service, we may provide respite for um, the caregiver, or even aid visits in our supported housing. We try to be as flexible as possible here in the Elder Service Plan to reach the goal of keeping our participants living safely in the community. My name is um, Patty Ferranti and um, I'm with the Elder Service Care Program and I absolutely love it. Just talking about it right now makes me want to cry. Before I was in the ESP, I was always calling my family and having them, you know, pick me up to take me to doctor's appointments and stuff like that. And now I, you know, now that I'm in ESP, I have the door-to-door um, -door service, coordinated care. My doctor always knows I'm coming. They always arrange my appointments. Everything is just so perfect. The program is fantastic, it really is. Any pain when you do that? As a physical therapist in the Elder Service Plan, a big part of my job is to help people keep up with their strength and balance. Um, a lot of times I see people after they get injured or some type of surgery. But uh, another part of my job is to make sure people stay active with the regular exercise program so they don't lose the strength and balance they gain back. What we do is we talk to the person to find out what they want. Do they want to increase their endurance, their strength? Do they want to be able to do things easier throughout the course of their day. We will work with them and develop a plan and we move forward with it. We try really hard to keep up with the mission of the program which is to keep people in the community of their choosing for as long as possible and as safe as possible. Even sometimes just a cane or a walker can make all the difference in making sure people stay safe. Very center to our plan and what we do here is the patient, the person. And uh, the way we deliver that care is by having a care plan which centers around a person's goals, their choices. As a medical director for the Yellow Service Plan for the last 25 years, uh, I've had the pleasure of watching our program grow enormously. While we started out largely in East Boston, we now serve participants in Chelsea, Revere, Everett, East Boston, and Winthrop. I think one of the real Great reasons for our success is our ability to uh, comprehensively coordinate our participants' needs. It's not just seeing the doctor or the nurse. Pharmacists, activities directors, nurses, nurse practitioners, van drivers, dietitians, all of us work together under one roof to keep our members healthy, active, and independent.